The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. A Challenger Lifetime Annuity can do more for portfolio outcomes. A combination of income streams, blending a Challenger Lifetime Annuity with other sources of retirement income, such as an account-based pension, means your clients can get the best of both worlds, guaranteed regular income for life, and access to capital as needed. Help more clients do more, live more, create more. Contact your Challenger BDM or visit challenger.com.au forward slash portfolio dash outcomes. For a retirement portfolio that can deliver more, read and consider the Challenger Lifetime Annuity, Liquid Lifetime, PDS and TMD from challenger.com.au. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I've got the pleasure of speaking with Ant McInnes from Absolute Wealth Advisors today. Ant, thank you for, for joining me. We were just chatting that that Darren from Ensemble kind of connected us uh, the other day. So thank you for, for joining me. Uh, looking forward to having a chat with you. Yeah, you're welcome, James. Um, another win for the ALPD. Yeah, yeah. We're just, uh, and it might be letting letting the cat out of the bag, but we've had a bit of an idea of, of potentially looking at recording some podcasts at the event. So there's 150 odd people in the room. And then you had actually had a great idea of uh, potentially getting a, a panel of advisors, three or four people in one go, which uh, which would make for an interesting podcast. But we'll see the next time mm. uh, that that's on the card. So yeah, as I said, thanks for thanks for joining me. Um, absolute wealth. I think a, f- a few people in in financial advice would would know of Paul and and, and Dean. They they you know they they uh, they run a whole host of different things. I know Dean. Uh, I've seen him on LinkedIn and and, and stuff for for a long time. What's it like working with those two guys? Uh, f- first off, and then I want to get into your career. Yeah, uh, it is fantastic, and thanks for having me today as well. Yeah, I've known Paul for a long time. On the podcast, obviously, can't see my broad shoulders, but I play hockey, so that's how I know Paul um, through Sydney Uni Hockey Club. Yeah. So, um, as a person, I've known him for a while, and I I love working with Paul um, or PB and Dean has been fantastic as well. When I when I first started with Absolute, he I met Dean on the very first day that I chucked a, a sickie from my other job to go talk with PB, um, and got to meet Dean then as well. So he's been so helpful along the journey as well. Yeah, I get a sense that that you'd be you'd be kind of on the the, the cutting edge isn't the right phrase, but but like trying things, you know, the the, the two of them are uh, quite generous in their time in, in kind of trying to educate and, and bring others along on the journey that are in other financial advice businesses. It, it, it'd be interesting to be on, on on the inside of of what's going on and things you're trying and so forth to to make the business better. So yeah, and. Um... The, the guys have a, a philosophy sort of of, and I've adopted as well, of giving anything a try for 90 days. And so, yeah. you know, if it's a bit of a new idea, that's okay. Let's give it a go and then assess it mm. and at least give it the opportunity to work or not work. Yeah, fantastic. Now, Ant, what about your, so we kind of invited you along specifically around the topic of kind of career change of, of, of sorts. Uh, as it, we, before we pressed record, you're kind of talking about this kind of mid-career career change. It's, you know, you, you're not uh, not late career, not early career. It's kind of smack bang in the middle. Tell, tell me about what you were up to before you decided to, to get into financial advice. Yes, thanks. Uh, so I turned 40 last week. Thanks for the, the presence, everyone. And so, but I started absolute a, a few years ago, three three and a bit years ago. Yeah. Um, before that, working at a consultancy company, FinTech, I guess, a large one internationally, but small, smaller in Australia. And I guess had a, a conversation with my manager at the time when he pulled me into the room for the usual chat. Hey, Ant, are you happy? Um, I sort of hesitated a bit before answering. Alarm bells went off for him. He said, okay, pause there. Go away and have a think about um, what you want to do. I that night reached out to a few 
people, mentors that I've had in my network, and, and one of them was PB. I just mm. spoke to just in a, a sort of a broader career sense, but the end result of that sort of conversation was, hey, by the way, I'm I'm hiring right now for associate advisor. Do you want to be an advisor? Mm. Um, and my pretty quick answer was yes, that's that's the goal there. So as I said, alluded to before, chucked a sickie the next day and went and sat with him and he was able to woo me with some of his amazing spreadsheets and other um, financial planning tools. Um, and yeah, found myself starting the the journey for PY here because I yeah. didn't um, meet any of the, I was a new entrant as per the, the rules. Hmm. So did did you did you have this you know kind of de- de- desire prior to your previous manager asking you if you were happy and, and you stumbled a bit before you answered? Did had you did you have an idea that you that you wanted to get into financial advice, or it was only after talking to Paul that that be- became something that you were keen on? So before my previous company, I worked ten years at Deutsche Bank uh, oh, yeah. in the the ops team there, but in wealth management pr- right. predominantly. So that was even though they were wholesale and um, mainly investment based, that was still my broader exposure to, I guess, the financial planning area. Yes. Um, Deutsche Bank decided to make the strategic exit from wealth management a few years ago now, five, five or six, mm. um, probably longer. And um, so I stuck around there to turn off the lights in the ops team and then had to find something else. Um, had had an option to go to Credit Suisse at the Wait, time. But they ended um, up turning their lights off too. <laughs> exactly. So I could have, uh, could have uh, used that experience, but... And I ended up going to well, Avalok was the the fintech um, yeah. as well. But so yeah, I guess to answer the question, financial planning had been an interest to me, um, mm-hmm. and I've been sort of exploring those networks all through um, my time at Avalok as well. Yep. Yeah. And so, what did the what did the studying path look like for you as a like as a as a new entrant? Did you have a related degree or anything like that? Like, what did you have to do? So back back uh, in my first undergrad years i did a i started out with a physics degree mm. so i started with physics at wollongong and uh with my electives decided to take on a bit of commerce related work um i had this vision of being a manager of scientists i don't don't know where it came from but that's that's what a you know 18 year old me wanted to do love the physics wasn't much good at it uh loved the commerce side of things um was relatively good at that stuck with that then you went into the grad program at Deutsche Bank when I was part of the sort of the close down there I had a lot of time because a lot of it was a bit of thumb twiddling um waiting for things to happen so I started applied finance at Macquarie um a master's there but that was just before the FASIA um requirements had come out Mm -hmm. I sort of took a gamble to say oh you know they've got financial planning subjects in it um they'll qualified but halfway through they didn't they decided no they weren't gonna <laughs> do the, the facia qualifications look i was enjoying it so finished off that masters but then had to jump into the grad diploma at, through kaplan um, yep. to to qualify so is it, got, is it the eight subjects or the 12 subjects i did the eight and yeah. got exemption for one the investments yeah. one um then okay. i still had to do everything else and yeah. i don't know um if you know much about the kaplan it's it's pretty intense in that you do two subjects a term, they have six terms, I, I think, but the terms overlap. So at some stage, you're doing like four subjects in one go. I don't know why they overlap them, but um, yes. Yeah, I did, uh, I did the uh, w- what was called the Graduate Diploma of Applied Finance. They, they kind of changed the name right towards the end and they made a, like, there's a financial planning stream. I'd, so I did the eight subjects, but I didn't ever overlap like that. I just. Mm-hmm. I did one at oh, like I was in my twenties, living at home with mum and dad. I didn't have any any pressures to to finish it in any great hurry. Yeah, did one subject at a time uh, to to get through the eight subjects. Yeah, so that was the the Kaplan. You you did that when you were at Absolute, or yeah. So um, when I when I started there, that was the understanding that I had to to go through that sort of new entrant pathway. Yeah. Um. So the the education first bit, and then you start your PY. When you yep. just about finished it, yeah, okay, 
And so how how long were you? So were you you were an associate advisor the whole time. You were like a, a client service manager or something. You, was, you had you were working as an associate. Yeah, with the with the model, I guess the business model that got it absolute. A mm-hmm. lot of the the CSO ops um, work is done by the team in Cebu. Oh yeah, right. yeah. Um, so we've got a great great re- set of resources there. Yeah. And so they were doing a lot of that work. So I sort of slotted straight straight away into, yeah. I guess, the, the associate role. And what 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 does the associate role look like for you at, at, at Absolute? Like, are you are you getting into client meetings from the get go, or what, what's what's a day in the life like? It, it was straight straight away into into client meetings, not running them, but yeah. um, sitting sitting next to um, PB and you know learning by being immersed. It was around that murky COVID, not COVID period as well. So yeah. sometimes in the office, sometimes not. Um, yeah. So I, I actually could probably count on two or three hands how many face-to-face client meetings that I've actually had over the years. Yeah. Um, so predominantly um, virtual, but straight into client discussions, helping with strategy, product research, putting together models, the real interesting stuff or stuff that I find interesting straight away. Yeah. So uh, the the professional year in some in in, in, in some workplaces gets a bit of a, a bad rap. Like it, that it's often more than a year. What what was your take on it? Was was it just a year? Did you was it was it longer? Look, it's it's possible to do it in a year. I did not take a year, so it was it was interesting. Towards the end, the, the end took the longest for me. And I imagine it would happen for a lot of people when I've spoken to a lot of colleagues who are sort of trying to finish it off. So at the end, you have to wrap up some co-signed statements of advice. That's yes, sort of, um, the bit of proof. And I had uh, a terror that if these statements of advice weren't hundred percent right, top to bottom, the auditor would because they were getting audited, not just sort of a check by um, some some random guy in compliance, yeah. but uh, externally audited. I had a terror that they would find an error and they'd go, "What?" What shop are they running at Absolute? We're going to lift up the hood and go in and look at everything. So it just took me so long to to make sure that every every statement of advice and underlying doc and all the bits and pieces were all lined up. Yeah, um, it's one so sort of got over that. Yeah. You have to write those ones, don't you? Is that is that what it's about? Like I didn't, I fortunately, didn't have to do the the, the professional year my, myself. Do, do you have to write those ones? You write them, present them, do the whole yeah. lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It all gets co-signed by your supervisor, um, mm. but yes. So everything from you know the initial the, the client meeting um, to discuss it, um, then creation of the strategy, production of the document, presentation, and then hopefully implementation. <laughs> How did those presentation meetings go for you? It's it's a learning curve, isn't it? Figuring out the balance between detail and um, the, the the volume of content. Um, and and sort of bouncing off the the client to sort of figure out how much they want to know. You know the old joke about engineers and teachers wanting a lot of detail, yeah, and um, you know some some being happy. But it it helped that in in this instance, most of the clients being presented to were long standing multi year clients of of the business. So there was that underlying trust that had already be being built up at yep. the time. Um, yep. So that, that certainly helped. I find some clients. And you know we we have some you know, some some people going through professional year. We've always got people going through professional year. Some clients love the fact that they're that they're involved in your development. Like particularly if they're long standing clients of the firm, and and all those conversations about family and you know what what's going on in their lives. You're obviously having all of those kind of things. But then there's some clients that really enjoy being part of seeing you grow and and, and go through it. And I'll kind of give you a bit of space to mess up something and they're not going to be terribly worried they 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 really enjoy being part of it like did you experience any of that yeah and it and you feel you feel that and it definitely helps with the the imposter syndrome or the the other you know hesitations that you might have as a new entrant coming in um where you can where you can sort of joke about being the the intern and um and it's also there there is that safety net underneath we say and by the way you know paul's checked everything that i do so yeah yeah i can like you know there's uh you know, julian who works with me my associate advisor is doing the professional year and, and there was one of the meetings that plays a particular client that that was really supportive of me when i was coming through you know 
the mm-hmm. the the development program that that we had what's now professional year, and then now I'm sitting I'm working with them they they kind of my my client now and then Julian who works with me is is taking over and they're kind of just as supportive of Julian working through professional year. Like they even said in the very first meeting that I introduced Julian, they said, oh, look, he's doing his professional year, blah, blah, blah. And they said, oh, maybe Julian can take over looking after us when he's done. And I said, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Oh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. But, because they know, as you're saying, you know, they know Paul's there. They know they know there's the support of the business and and you wouldn't be putting someone forward for professional year if you didn't have the confidence in them in the first place. I think that's one of the real strengths of bringing on a professional year candidate as well. It's that succession planning that the clients can see that there's sort of a plan B as well coming in behind yeah. um, advisors. So they, you know, we, we talk about long-term outcomes for clients. Well, if the advisor's only there for the short term for whatever reason, yeah. um, that, that succession planning I've found has been pretty valuable to talk to through with those yeah. clients. Yep. Can you talk a bit about, you know, without, without specifics around numbers, but but I imagine there's a there's a hesitation for you know mid career career changes like you were kind of describing yourself before around like a reduction in salary. So mm. you know you've you spend all these years you know through to your you know kind of mid to late thirties building a career doing certain things. Your salary is going to get to a particular level, and then you take a leap into something related, but also something new. I imagine there was a drop back in your salary before then you progress as an advisor and then your advisor's salary starts to take off. Like how did you manage that piece of the of the transition? Um the the first part was to realise that it was gonna happen. So it wasn't um uh trying to pretend that oh maybe I won't have to halve my salary, which is what ended up happening. Um so after realizing that was one of the necessary implications then obviously talking to important ones in your your family because it has you no know, flow on effects of mm-hmm. um, expenditure and it would become more difficult now I uh, imagine with price of things and interest rates etc. Yeah. Um, and then having those open discussions with the hiring side as well to see what the the pathway would be. I I've got a financial coach as well that I talk through with a lot of um you know these sort of matters as well and so looking at the pathway and the short-term implications, so reduction in salary with that pathway that you're speaking about and sort of not agreeing it in writing. There was a gentleman's agreement, but more achieve these milestones. This is where you can end up and yeah. building a bit of a spreadsheet as you have to um, to sort of see what that would look like. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's important that you 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 agree on the expectations really, isn't it, with the, with the new employer to say, look, if... If I do these things, what what are you going to going to offer? And if you've got a good employer, they're going to be they're going to be upfront to say, look, we we pay you know, associate advisors X and we pay advisors Y, and there's a this is the the growth or this is this is the the mechanics around how your salary may increase over time. If they're upfront with it, then you've got something to work towards. Did you like? Did you save up a bit of you know a bit of a, a bit of a buffer of, of of money or anything or or did you just kind of just jump straight in you're already okay on that front uh i we did save up um mm. it it worked out from from my circumstance that when i finished at deutsche bank that was a redundancy so that uh, was the ten, the, yeah. the cushion for us but saying that i i had a or well, we had a a, a little kid about mm. a year before moving as well, so my wife was working a lot less. Um, so there were, you know, the discretionary expenditure sacrifices. Yeah. But I did a lot of, I guess, soul searching and um, a lot of self help books and and those sort of and and other conversations leading into it. And um, it's a bit of a cliche that money's not the most important thing you need. It, there's, you know, we work in financial planning. We know that it and how necessary it is. Um, but I didn't go as deep as, you know, really writing down all my values and understanding my why as, as some people might. But if I, if I reflected on the things that gave me the most interest leading up to the the career change as well, Mm -hmm. it was all sort of in some way like financial cleaning related, you know, like looking at investments or helping talking to my parents or friends about that sort of thing or yeah. even bizarrely a bit of insurance stuff as well, but not to, not to, not to, not to, not to. Well, 
<laughs> one of the few that, in, that might enjoy it a little bit, the insurance side of it. So how's it, like, what, what's it like for you now versus what you th- thought it would be like? Is it, is it terribly different for you? Not terribly different, but it mm. is different. Mm. Uh, there is, uh, I guess, a bit of a gap to jump over between being an uh, advice suggester and just sort of, hey, here are the options and here are the implications and being able to have the confidence to sort of be the advice provided to sort of say, hey, cool, we've looked at everything and this is what I recommend, this is what I think you should do. Yeah. And that that has taken a, a little bit to build up um, as well. And I, I, to be honest, I still sort of, that's what I still work on. Yeah. Um, the compliance side of things is always going to be there. So, you know, you expect all that that underlying documentation. I came from an ops background anyway, so printing things out and getting signatures and staples and those sorts of things isn't a big deal for me. Yeah, okay. Um, yep. And I, I guess it's one of the, the major things as well is sort of how um, you, you, the interactions with clients slowly evolves over time um, with how, how you sort of go on a journey with, with those clients and it, it, as I've gone on a journey with my, you know, career development and my own personal development as well, you sort of go along with that um, with some of the clients as well. So that that aspect of it's been really surprising. Yeah. Have you have you found yourself working with any career change people? And the you know, there's often this kind of underlying thing that happens in financial advice is that you you attract people like you. They're at a you know, similar kind of stage of life or going through similar similar events as you as. Has that played out in in your financial advice world at all? I have had one um, one client that um, was starting to go through that sort of journey, yeah. that sort of the consideration, and so yeah, helping them with understanding um, one that 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 financial side of things, um, but yeah, also I guess a bit of the mindset um, work as well that we we went through leading up to it, and then they're they're on the hunt now as well for the career change, so I haven't taken the jump, so I haven't been able to help them on the other side yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be, be good if they come back and help them. <laughs> you, you, you said earlier on that you could count on maybe, you know, two or three hands, the number of in-person meetings that, you'd be, that you've had. Uh, even now, are you still doing a lot of meetings online? Yeah, we as a, as a business have decided that um, virtual is our, our starting point. Right, okay. Um, at Absolute, we've got um, another advisor, Stella, she's down in Southern Highlands, New South Wales, Southern Highlands. Yep. Ross Moray's on Gold Coast. Um, Paul's at DY. And then I'm out uh, near Campbelltown in, in okay. Sydney there as yep. well. So sort of They're all the folks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. And Dean lives in the West um, <laughs> as well as Sydney. So. And how, so what is your, like, can, can you talk through how you're interacting with, with clients then? Like, is there a, set meeting process? Do you have certain presentations or something that, that you're doing? Like, can, can you talk through what that what that online interaction looks like? Yeah, it's as as I've started out PY and then at now Advisor, that sort of interaction has changed as well because of what happened, you know, in, in 2022 as well. Um, so COVID forcing that, a lot of that virtual work. Now, the business was virtual before then, um, but sort of accelerated it. Um so prospect meetings um, are all either phone or the virtual meetings um, now, 15-minute um, sort of screening call, I guess. Yep. And the business has a bit of a background in um, the Fitzpatrick's work. So there's the 10-3 now um, process that, that we go through, which is great, sort of an hour, hour and a half for new clients. Again, virtual, um, where we've got a bit of a template that sometimes we – up on the screen and hand write on. Um, sometimes it's just conversations. Yep. Um, and then we always like to book in. Uh, after that, we'll we'll send through a service proposal, and we normally um, book in a meeting two weeks after that. That ten three now. Yep. That's sort of a stakeholder to sort of give it the the green light, red light. Um, in terms of going ahead. Mm. Then, depending on client availability, generally we like to get in a two week cadence. Of, of meetings to keep the momentum going um, up until the first bit of advice is delivered. The nature of the clients that we're dealing with, they're a bit more complicated. So rather than a initial meeting, get some information, 
do the analysis, here's our recommendations, then implement, um, you know, like a super switch or something. Basically, they're a bit more complicated in terms of ownership structures um, or intergenerational transfers and, and those sorts of things that so can take a, a few more meetings. But again, all virtual, um, but the two-week cadence works well just to keep everyone on track and uh, accountable. Yep. So what do you, can you... Can you talk through like what the normal schedule of those two weeks meeting two week meetings would be? So there's there's that kind of longer initial meeting. You're doing your ten three now uh, conversation with them. What's the next one? Two weeks after that, that's the decision to say yes or no. We're going ahead. Yeah. Now they might have signed up before then, so we can do some basic admin work. Then like um, going through the risk profile um, yeah. and validating fact find. Um, um, we'd like to get as much information off the client ahead of and then pre-populate a, a fact find and get that ticked off. Um, yeah. And that's where a lot of the work that me and, and the team will do. Yep. Um, and then depending on what their burning issue is, you, you know, that clients will often come with, there, there was a specific trigger of something that they want solved. So that generally forms the the starting point. It might be, hey, I've got the inheritance. Okay, cool. Let's let's look at that. Um, yeah. Or my insurance is costing me so much. Let's look at that first. So we like to get the win first with what the client um, wants wants to solve urgently, mm -hmm. but then expand it out to a broader plan, so building a model, and then we'll go through iterations of the model um, to have a base case and then come up with some different scenarios depending on what they might want to do. So they might be looking at a rent vesting versus just owning primary residence. Mm -hmm. um, it might be um, investing in a share portfolio versus super contributions you know sort of the basic decisions that that we as financial planners have to help them with yeah in the background as well then it might be checking um their insurance as well um and checking super as well and that sort of like runs concurrently with that model model yeah. progression as well and how did the like the the delivery of the statement of advice as much as i hate to kind of re refer to it like that like we what form does that take and 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 and, and where in the process is that being delivered? Yeah, we, because of the complexity, we generally, and, and sort of this tranched approach to the meeting, we generally do multiple SOAs, yeah. um, which probably adds extra effort, or would add extra effort um, involved, but we, we think it's a better client outcome in terms of, so, you know, solving those immediacy problems and then some of the longer term issues that might um, take many months um, to resolve. Rather than holding up the short term quick wins, we sort of do a, you know, a second statement of advice later. So, gotcha. um, or or even a third, depending on you know what what's involved. Yep. We'll discuss the strategy um, as broadly as possible leading into it, and then it's a virtual presentation of the statement of advice. Um, okay. Um, at the moment on screen, um, you know, scrolling through a Word doc. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I like it. So then you say each of those. Document. So each of those advice documents are really kind of scoped down to, hey, we're just dealing with this problem in this piece of advice and the other problems we've identified we'll deal with the next time around. Yeah, um, that's, that's right. And we, as best possible, we scope out those milestones at the start as well. So we can, we've got the full set of scope, but we mm -hmm. sort of, through experience or conversation, can figure out, hey, that one's going to be phase two, this part's going to be phase three. Oh, you've told us you're... You know, you're selling your business in 24 months. Okay, obviously that's going to be phase four, but we're there. Yep. We'll start preparing for it now. Yep, yep. Now, I I noticed on your website earlier when I was just having a look. It, there's there's a reference to you being a co-owner of the of the business. I, I I'm interested to hear how, as much as you may be able to share, like how how how's that come about? What are, so like you know the. Yeah, did, did did you buy some? Is it is it part of like a, a you know you kind of earn part of the the business over time? Like what's what's that setup look like for you? So that this is always a a fear of people taking on PY candidates. Is it's uh, I spend all this time, invest all this time training up a, a person, and as soon as they get qualified, they're going to jump ship mm -hmm. and, and go somewhere else. So, True. Um, this equity ownership forms a piece of the puzzle, um, I guess, as a retention strategy. Um, you could you could look at it like that. Yeah. Um, but it was always a um, a discussion from day one to say, hey, at this point in time, becoming a um, a full advisor will give you the opportunity 
to to buy into the business. So okay. it wasn't a sort of a um, a free handball. It was definitely just buy, buying in to it, but taking a you know a ten percent stake there. So meaningful Beautiful stake. Link. Yeah, that's right. So um, and that was always discussed from pretty much day one in terms of um, yeah. starting the whole PY journey, as well as incentive for me to push through the PY as, as fast as possible. That benefits yeah. me, benefits the business. Um, yeah. And the, and Paul and Dean, they were the, well, they still are the, the majority owners of, of Absolute as well. So yeah. um appreciate their transparency from the very start as well to sort of say, hey, if you meet these criteria, this is an option for you. Yeah, that's great. That, that's incredible. Can you, the 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 funding of that like there's a there's a couple of banks out there that will fund financial advice businesses. I know similar story to you. Borrowed some money to to buy the stake in the business that I own through through one of the banks, and there's a relatively short in the scheme of a mortgage uh, repayment schedule on, on on that. Did you go down a similar route with that, or did you borrow it against your house? Like where'd you come up with the money from? So it's uh we we took on the vendor finance route for this one. So um the business itself um has the line of credit for the bank. And yep. Um that's how I funded it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, we're just interested to hear uh, cause, because I've lived that myself and uh, mm. it's interesting to see how how others have done it. Like my loans secured against the assets of the business, but anyway, I'll, all I know is I need to make a monthly repayment back to a uh, the particular loan to, uh, to to pay it off in time. Mm. So where to from from here for you? Like what's 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 next? It's been a know, a pretty rapid three and a half years or so to to do the PY, come out the other end, uh, own a ten percent stake in the business. Like you've achieved a lot in in a in a pretty short period of time. What's what's next? Well, we at the business we've got uh, aspirations of moving to four day week working week over the next few years. We, the fifth day will be called the the gift of the fifth. So, provided you've got everything done, you can take that that last day off. We're working, so that's a, a big focus for our business over the next few years, and obviously me personally as well. We're going through a, a bit of a phased approach where by you know the end of June, everyone um, the, the the task has been to save two hours a month, uh, two hours a week, two hours a week, um, everyone, and then yep. so that equals a day a month off. Um, eight days, eight eight hours a month. So that's mm. the day a month, and then a further two hours a week um, over the next twelve months, and then a further four hours a week over the next twelve months. So that's in two years' time. Yeah, and that's the eight days a week. Yep. Um, so, that, so do you go from? Does it go from a, a day a month to a day a fortnight to then a day a week? Is that the exactly. how it's going to work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the plan. Yeah, um, as well. Yeah, and I know like Tribeca's doing the uh, the four day. Four day or a, a week thing, and I think in the in the beginning they didn't they didn't even tell their clients that that's what they were doing. I think they wanted to see if they could if they could it essentially kind of ha- not have the clients notice, and that that's you know that's a good outcome if if the clients don't don't know any different. Uh, uh, yeah, a, a good outcome. So they they've stuck with it for a while. <laughs> yeah, that client experience will be go. it'll be interesting. Where so there's the quick wins that you can do to sort of try and save. Save a few hours here or there, you know, adoption of AI for file notes and and those sorts of things. But then we're looking at broader things like CRM and investment philosophies as well to sort of see if we can make bigger, bigger changes that will give you know bigger bang of bang for buck. But they'll take you know multi year sort of implementations. Yeah, are you doing something with file notes, AI and file notes at the moment? Yeah, we're Copilot. We're on board with Copilot at the moment, so um, recording those. So what is that? So we're in Teams now. Mm. Like, do you use? So you use Teams for your your your, your meetings with clients? Yeah, that was. So um, what what does Copilot then do? Like this, we'll get a, we'll get a, a, a transcript, a, a word document that might be ten pages long of us talking this afternoon. But what have, what does Copilot then do? So we um, run a, just a series of prompts because it's all about prompts um, for how these AI tools work, um, and it's pretty basic. Um, generate client friendly summary at the end of it. Um, spits out about six sentences um, yeah. or longer for a, a, a for a client meeting. The meetings just happened, so I go, oh, it missed this one, or I want a bit more detail in what. So I'll go expand on the downsizing conversation, and I'll 
send out another you know, yeah. couple of sentences on that. Yeah. Copy that into a, an email. Give me action points. That's the next prompt. It says, you know, and contact CFS about downsize a form or something like that. Um, give you all the action points, about five or six or whatever. Copy that into the email. So that's a, a nice little summary that's sent to the client within about 10, 15 minutes of the meeting. Yeah. We run a, a larger extract for our in sort of internal file note. Did, did we talk about FSG, TIC, yeah, those sorts of things. And then the plan will be to then implement the action points um, in sort of another half an hour or so off the back of that AI-generated file note, with the idea that a whole client meeting is wrapped up in like an hour of power after um, a client meeting and everything sort so of you, off your desk. You'll get to try and get the AI to implement the action points. Well, that that would be fantastic. <laughs> so at the moment, just sending out the emails to yeah, okay, and then so you've got like the, you. the team in Cebu or whatever that'll yeah, get this form, get that form, or whatever they need to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, the AI we had for a while experimented with our Cebu team either sitting in on client meetings and like taking notes, um, or just listening so they got the context, or we found that they were watching the video after, so spend an hour watching a video. And then spend an hour, uh, you know, trans not transcribing, but writing it nicely before the use of AI. Yeah. And then another half hour of formatting, etc. So like two and a half hours for a, a file note now is down, hopefully to about twenty minutes. Um, that's a big save because yeah, it's a lot. That's the thing with the with recording it, and you've got you've got the record there. But if someone has to listen to your yeah, hour long meeting from start to finish, then it's a bit a bit of a double up in time. Yeah, yeah. Got to get onto this co-pilot. Lots of people talking about it. We haven't even started uh, trying it. So we'll get onto that soon. And look, thanks for, for joining me this afternoon. It's been been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, some some gold there that I'm going to use mm-hmm. right at the very end for anyone else that's uh, that's tuning in right right to the end. So as I said, thanks for joining me on, uh, on, on short notice. It's been good to chat with you. Great. Thanks very much, James. No worries. <laughs>